All right, have your Bibles. Uh, kind of go ahead and be turning, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to start there in a little while, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll go on to uh, we'll go on to something else to another text. Uh, but uh, as we as we begin with this, let me just tell you about a fellow by the name of William Cooper. How many know who William Cooper was? Anybody? You do? Okay. Very good. Who was he? He was a songwriter. Yeah. Do you know what song he's most famous for? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. You're exactly right. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. My, what a wonderful truth that is in song. But did you know that William Cooper was a man who was given to great periods of depression? Even though he had this wonderful hope, he had great periods of depression in his life. In fact, he actually tried to kill himself on several occasions. Twice he tried to hang himself. And on his third attempt to hang himself, it almost worked. He actually, as he was hanging, he actually became unconscious. But then the rope broke. And, and, and it say, it, it say, you know, don't laugh, it's not funny. But, but it, the rope broke and, and, and the, it actually saved his life. But as a result of that attempted suicide, uh, Cooper spent 18 months in an insane asylum. He spent 18 months in an insane asylum where, where he actually had a, a Christian doctor who led him to faith in Jesus Christ. And Cooper was wonderfully born again. However, for the rest of his life, for the rest of his life, from time to time, from time to time, he was tormented with the idea that he had committed the unforgivable sin. He, he's forgiven, he's committed a sin that God can never forgive. And so therefore he wrote concerning himself. You remember I told you he hanged himself and the rope broke? Who does that remind you of? In the Bible. Remember Judas Iscariot? He went out and hanged himself, the rope broke, and he fell down and busted all asunder and all of that. Well, here, here's, what, here's what Cooper wrote concerning himself. Damned below Judas. Yeah, that's, that was his opinion. Damned below Judas, more abhorred than he was, who, fo who for a few pence sold his holy master. That was his opinion. That was his opinion. You see, Cooper believed that he committed sins against God that God would never be able to forgive. That God would never be able to forgive. And, and, and sadly, there are many people, many people today, who, who have that same idea. And, and they have that idea because they have a misunderstanding of the text that we're going to be looking at and considering together for the next, for the next few minutes. Uh, just to put it very bluntly, Jesus does say that there is a sin that will never be forgiven. Not in this life and not in the life to come. Now, he makes that very clear. But what is it? What is it? So let's look at the text together. Let's notice the text by beginning, first of all, with the context. Context is always very important. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Now, as a result of this miracle, not only was there the deliverance of this man from the, from the demon that had possessed him, there, there was also a physical healing from, from the physical ailments that, that he was suffering, the blindness and, and, and the dumbness. And, and, so, and so we see all of that, but we also want to notice that as a result of this miracle, not only did God do a great work in this man's life individually, there is also a very clear revelation. There's a clear revelation that is also given. In other words, because of this miracle, we find revealed three prominent opinions that people held about Jesus Christ. There are three prominent opinions that people held. And so in a parallel passage, now turn to Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, we're going to see a parallel passage. We're going to see how, how 
three different groups of people <clears throat> viewed the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, to His friends, He was demented. To His friends, He was demented. Uh, in, in Mark chapter 3, verse 20, verse 21, <coughs> excuse me, and the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. For they said, he is beside himself. That's a nice way of saying he's gone mad. He, he's lost his mind. Uh, that, that's what his friends had to say. You, you see, the crowds were coming and, and the demands of the ministry had become so intense that the Lord Jesus and, and His disciples, in fact, the Bible tells us, they did not even have time to eat. They, they couldn't even stop and take a break to have a meal. The, the people are coming to, and they're demanding the Lord's attention. They're demanding the, that He might do something for them. And, and so as, as, as they're working and, and not even able to eat, word begins to spread, as you can imagine. The word spread. Eventually, it spreads all the way from Capernaum back to Nazareth, where the Lord Jesus had grown up. And so therefore, His friends... They came. They came to lay hold on Him and to take Him home. The Greek word translated friends uh, carries an idea not just of a, oh yeah, he's my buddy, that kind of a thing. Uh, in, in, in the Greek, it actually carries the idea of, of a close relation. E even a kinsman, okay? Even a kinsman. Uh, and, and so these were... Uh, Mark chapter 3, if you look down in Mark chapter 3, down verse number 31, uh, these friends were probably his mother and his brethren. They're the ones who've come. They're, they're the ones who have come to see him. And, and I believe their actions may have been motivated by two things. First of all, I, I think they came, first of all, because of their, their concern for the Lord Jesus. Their concern for him. They, they heard that he's working constantly. Uh, they've heard about the great pressures that the ministry is putting upon him. Uh, they, they've heard about how that he's not even eating properly. Uh, they, they've heard all of these things. And so, therefore, they want to come. They want to get him. They want to take him home so that they can properly take care of him. But, but since his half-brothers, uh, remember John chapter 7, verse 5, they didn't believe on him. They, they didn't believe who he was. And so his half-brothers uh, probably were most certainly motivated not so much by a concern for the Lord Jesus. They're motivated by a shame of the Lord Jesus. I mean, after all, they're embarrassed by the notoriety that he is put bringing on their family. Uh, he, he's embar they're embarrassed by all of the attention that his preaching and his miracles are stirring up and, and, and bringing on the family. And, and they're just kind of embarrassed by all of that. But, but the bottom line is they're convinced that the Lord Jesus is, as the Bible says, uh, he is just beside himself. He's beside himself. He's, he's lost his mind. He's gone mad. He's basically demented. That was... That was his friends. Now, if that's what your friends think about you, you can imagine what your enemies think, right? You imagine what the enemies think. His enemies, to his enemies, uh, they believed that he was demonic. They believed that he was demonic. The ministry of the Lord Jesus in Capernaum has come to the attention of the, of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. They've heard what Jesus is doing They've heard how that He's healing the sick and all the wonderful things that are going on. He's casting out demons. Multitudes of people are, are flocking to Him. And so they send a delegation from Jerusalem to go up to Capernaum. They want to check this thing out. They, they want to see what is going on. And so the delegation arrives just in time to see the Lord Jesus casting a demon out of this man and, and, and healing his blinded eyes, loosing his dumb tongue so that he can speak. And, and, and so they, they witness that. They witness that. Now you need to remember, you need to remember that when we think about the miracles that the Lord Jesus did, those were things that had actually been prophesied. 
These were signs so that Israel would recognize their Messiah when he came. In fact, that's why the prophet Isaiah said this. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 and verse number 6. He's talking about when the Messiah comes, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. And so when the Lord Jesus comes on the scene, He's performing these amazing miracles. You can imagine anybody, anybody who knew the Scriptures, anybody who knew what the prophet Isaiah had prophesied, immediately it would come to their mind, well, this must be the Messiah. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Notice it in Mark or Matthew chapter 12, verse number 23. All of the people were amazed and said, Is not this the Son of David? Is not this the Son of David? Is not this our promised Messiah that would come through the line and through the lineage of David? Truly, this is the one. Look at all these miracles that He's doing. And yet when the Pharisees and the scribes, when they heard the people making this statement, they literally went ballistic. They, they went ballistic. And so let's notice a couple of things. First of all, notice their accusation. Their accusation. The, the scribes did not deny that the Lord Jesus had performed a great miracle. There's no way they could deny the miracle. I mean, the proof was right there in front of them. They could not deny the fact that a miracle had been performed. They also could not deny that the miracle had been performed by supernatural power. There's no way they could deny that. Humanly speaking, it was unexplainable. So it had to be supernatural power. But notice the accusation in Mark chapter 3, verse 22. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. The bottom line here, the accusation of those scribes was that the Lord Jesus had performed miracles, and it was an amazing miracle, but it was a miracle that was performed not by the power of God, but it was performed by the power of Satan. That, that was their accusation. That, that, in other words, the Lord Jesus was a, was a minister, not of God, but a minister of Satan. A minister of Satan. Now notice how the Lord Jesus responds to this accusation. Notice He gives them their answer. In Mark chapter 3, verse number 23, and he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, Can Satan cast out Satan? Now, you'll, you'll notice this is, a, this is a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. The answer is obvious. Uh, the answer is obvious that Satan cannot cast out Satan. But, but the Lord Jesus then continues by giving three illustrations to prove his point. He's going to give three illustrations to show these religious leaders just how illogical that their accusation really was. And so he gave them, first of all, a secular illustration. A secular illustration. And, and here's the secular illustration that he gives them. He says in verse number 24, If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Now, anybody who's ever studied history knows the truth of this statement, right? You, 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 see, you see through history times and examples where, where kingdoms have, come, have become divided. And, and as a result of the division, that kingdom has fallen and, and has become easy prey for an enemy. And so, and so the Lord gives this, He gives them a secular illustration to show just how illogical their accusation is really was. So not only did he give a secular illustration, he also gives a social illustration. He, he brings it down from a kingdom and he brings it down to the home. And, and, and in verse number 25, here's what he says. If a house, a family, if a family be divided against itself, then that house cannot stand. It cannot stand. So there's the secular illustration. The social illustration. 
But then the Lord's going to take it down even further from the, from the kingdom to the home to the heart of a man. Here's what he says. Notice the spiritual illustration. The spiritual illustration in verse number 26. If Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. Bottom line, on every level, the argument and the accusation of these religious leaders was illogical. It was illogical. But then he says something else, and this is, this is really neat. Look what he says in verse number 27. He says, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Do, 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 do you kind of see how this fits? The Lord Jesus explains what these religious leaders have just witnessed. He explains to them what they have just seen. It's not by the works of Satan, but the Lord Jesus explains to them that He has entered into Satan's house. He's entered into a place where Satan was ruling and reigning. He has bound Satan. He has freed Satan's captive. And, 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 and what a wonderful, what a wonderful statement that is. And, and, and it actually is a statement that proves the great truth that we find in 1 John 4, 4. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. He can enter into the house of the strong man. He can bind the strong man. He can set free those who are enslaved by the strong man. Is he doing it by the power of Satan? Oh, no, no. Satan divided himself, cannot stand. He's doing it by the power of God. And so greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so concerning the Lord Jesus, his, his friends, they, they said he was demented. His enemies, they, they said he was demonic. But then there were his followers. There were his followers. And to his followers, they said, he is divine. He is divine. You see, to become one of his followers, it's very basic. To become one of his followers, men had to believe. They, they had to believe. In fact, you remember what Jesus himself said in John chapter 8, verse number 24. He said this. He said, if ye believe not, that I am He? If you do not believe that I am the promised Messiah, if you do not believe that I'm the Son of God who came to, to be a, a, a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world, if you do not believe that I am He, here's going to be the result. You're going to die in your sin. You'll die in your sin. And so therefore, the testimony of His disciples, as you go through, let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, take example, the testimony of Nathanael. Remember Nathanael in John chapter 1, verse 49, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. You're the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. You're the promised Messiah that was foretold. We believe this. We, we know this to be true. And they gave testimony. They gave testimony to His divinity. And, and then, of course, we would also certainly have to mention the testimony of Simon Peter. You remember Simon Peter in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16? Peter gives that great statement of faith. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. By the way, the same thing is still true today. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be truly born again into God's family, uh, in order for all of that to become a reality, we must believe who Jesus Christ is. We must believe that He is the perfect, holy, sinless Son of God. We have to believe that He is the one who came to die in our place and to pay the penalty for our sins. But I want you to notice how the Lord Jesus presents this truth to those scribes who have said that He was an instrument of Satan. Notice how He presents this truth in verse number 28, 29, and 30. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, 
all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. Hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because, and here's why he says this. He said it because they said that Jesus Christ was operating under the power of an unclean spirit. He was operating under the power of the unclean spirit. Now again, these verses have been misunderstood. They have been wrongly applied by, by many. And, and the result of that has been an emotional despair of hopelessness. An emotional despair of hopelessness for many people, just like William Cooper that we talked about in the beginning. Many people have been in that same boat. Many people have gone through that same thing. The text tells us exactly, though, what the Lord Jesus is talking about. Those, those scribes had blasphemed God's Holy Spirit when they said that Jesus was operating under the power of an unclean spirit. That was a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit of God. In, in other words, they had ignored, they had ignored the words of the prophet in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 2, when the prophet said, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Notice it. And, here's verse 2, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. Now we know this prophecy was fulfilled. In Matthew chapter 3 and, and verse number 16, here's what it says, that when Jesus was baptized, He went up straightway out of the water, Lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Therefore, you remember the Apostle Peter. He makes that great statement. It's found in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse number 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God was with him. But those scribes ignoring the Scriptures, they accused the Lord Jesus of being filled and operating under the power of an unclean spirit from Satan. And for that, the Lord Jesus said there will never be any forgiveness. Now, now let me stop right here and just make two points very clear about this, about this unforgivable sin. Uh, I, I want to make two points very clear. And, and, I, and I think I told you in the little note that I sent out with the study notes for tonight, I, I actually had this question given to me this, this past week. Somebody sent me a text message and said, Pastor, what about, what about the unforgivable sin? Is it suicide? That was their question. That was their question. So, so let me just tell you what this, uh, give you a couple of points about this unforgivable sin. First of all, let me tell you what it is not. What it is not. Uh, and, and so let's just take some things off the list, okay? First of all, it is not taking God's name in vain. That's, that's, not, that's not an unforgivable sin. It, it, it's not taking Jesus' name in vain. That, 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 that's not an unforgivable sin. Uh, it, it, it's not adultery. It, it's not uh, sexual perversion. Uh, it, it's not uh, any of the other uh, sexual sins that are so prevalent in society. Today. None of those things are unforgivable. None of those are unforgivable. Uh, it's not murder. Murder is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, multiple murders is not the unpardonable sin. Genocide is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, in fact, committing suicide, which basically is nothing more than self-murder, that is not an unpardonable. That is not an unpardonable sin. Now, please, I don't want you to go out of here tonight and say, "Oh, oh yeah, Pastor Crocker, he said, yeah, boy, you know, uh, all this stuff, we can do it, and it's okay." No, I did not say it's okay. Okay, it's sin. It's sin, and God deals with sin, but God will forgive it. That, that, that's the point I want you to get. 
God will forgive it. In fact, that wonderful verse, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, what's the next word? All unrighteousness. Not just the little things, but all unrighteousness. He's able to forgive that. He's willing to forgive that. He desires to forgive that because Christ died for those things. So, so that's what, that, this unpardonable sin, that's what it is not. So, what is it? What is it? Those scribes had not come from Jerusalem on a whim. Okay? They, uh, they, they, they did not just show up and just happen to see this thing. And, and then they just suddenly jumped to the conclusion, oh yeah, well, this guy must be empowered by Satan. That, that, that did not happen like that. It, it didn't happen on a whim. They've actually been on a journey. They, they've been on a journey and, and they've been holding this idea from the very beginning of our Lord's ministry. In fact, I like the way one commentator noted. Here's what he said. He said, if you follow the religious leaders in the book of Mark, you will notice they are on a journey. When you first meet them, they are full of curiosity. They saw Jesus do these things and they had questions, but their curiosity, see here's the danger, their curiosity became indifference. And their indifference began to metastasize into a malicious attitude that became so hateful and vengeful that it ultimately nailed Jesus Christ to a cross. This is the path that they're on. And they've been on it for a while. This is, they're on a mission. They're on a mission here. And, and, and that point is very clearly seen in the language of our text. In, in, in Mark chapter 3, verse 30, here, here's what they said. They said, He hath an unclean spirit. Now I want you to notice the words, He said. Now I'm not a Greek linguist, but I have read in the Greek language that phrase, they said, is in the imperfect tense. In other words, what that means is simply this. This is not something they said just once. This is something they said over and over and over and over and over and over. You get the idea? And over some more. They are constantly saying, he's got an unclean spirit. This was in their mind all of the time. This was their constant mantra. And every time they heard of a miracle being performed by the Lord Jesus Christ, their answer to it was, it's by the power of Satan. It's by the power of Beelzebub. Now the Bible teaches that when the Holy Spirit convicts us to repent and be saved, when the Holy Spirit calls us to turn from sin and, and to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches that we have a free will. We can reject that. We can reject His call. We, we, we can reject it and we can reject it and we can reject it until we become so hardened against it that we reach a point. We reach a point just like the Pharaoh of Egypt when we no longer have the ability to repent. We no longer have the ability to repent. We've rejected and rejected and rejected and we've go past a point. Now we no longer have the ability. Just like the Pharaoh. Just like the Pharaoh. In other words, I, I remember when I was learning how to play a guitar. Actually, I don't really play a guitar. I just kind of strum along, you know. But, uh, but I remember I had those strings, you know, and, you, and, and boy, I, you know, I've, Thought I'm going to be like Chet Atkins here in about a week, and so I, you know, I, I started I started playing on that thing, and and I played about thirty minutes, and boy, my fingers started hurting, and 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 what happened was it was it was tender, and those strings were cutting into the finger, but but as I the more I I kept at it, I kept at it, and the more I kept at it, you know what, my fingers got tougher, you know why? It grew calluses. Got calluses on the end of my finger, right? Yeah, got calluses. 
You know that, that, that you can do that to your heart? Yeah. yeah. You can do that to your heart? You, you, you keep saying no to God? You, you keep refusing to submit to His salvation? Submit to His will for your life? You can say no, no, no to the point your heart becomes calloused. Your heart becomes calloused. Our ears cannot hear the truth. And we put ourselves in a place that is unforgivable. We put ourselves in a place that is unforgivable. In fact, that's why Psalm 95, verse number 8, the Bible gives us the very clear warning. Harden not your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Those scribes were diligent students. Think about this. Those scribes were diligent students of the Scriptures. They were men who their whole life was devoted to studying the Scriptures. And they, were the, they were the religious lawyers. And, and, their, and their whole life was diligently spent studying the Scriptures. They were students of the Scriptures. Bottom line, you know what that means? That, that means that this sin that Jesus said can never be forgiven, that sin was committed by the most religious people of that day. Wow, that's something to think about, isn't it? That sin was committed by the most religious people of that day. And even today, even today, people may become totally hardened to God's truth, even though it is constantly being shown to them. Even though they are constantly going to church and they, and they hear the message over and over and over until after a while, it really doesn't make any difference anymore. Or, or, or maybe they hear sermon after sermon until their hearts are no longer stirred. Their hearts are no longer convicted. Calluses. Calluses. Or, or, or maybe they even read their Bible. They get one of those little Bible reading schedules we gave out on Sunday and, and, they, and they read their Bible every day and, and, and they go through all of the Scriptures and, and, and they go through it and they become, so, they become so familiar with it that it no longer registers. You get the idea? The bottom line, the unforgivable sin is when the Holy Spirit calls for a man to repent of his sin and to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and yet he stubbornly refuses. He stubbornly rebels. He hardens his heart. He refuses. And, and by his actions, he, he may never say it with his mouth. He may never say it with his mouth. But by his actions, here's what he's saying. He's actually saying that the Holy Spirit is unreliable. And the Holy Spirit is untrustworthy. And what the Holy Spirit is saying to him is not worthy of his consideration blasphemy against the holy spirit and that's a terrible thing it's a tragic thing because to reject the holy spirit's invitation to receive christ as your savior is the one listen carefully it is the one and only sin that will never be forgiven not in this world or in the world to come to reject christ and the wooing of the Holy Spirit to receive Christ, that is the one and only sin that can never be forgiven. So I want to encourage you tonight. I know most of you here, you have a testimony of, of salvation, but I, I would encourage you. You know, even the Apostle Paul said, well, sometimes we need to go back and just kind of examine ourselves and, and make our calling and our election sure. Just make sure that we've really been born again. But, but not only do we need to be examining our own self, we, we need to understand there's still a lot of other people out there who need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. They, they need to have an opportunity to hear the truth of God's Word so that God's Spirit might speak to their hearts. And when we sow the seed of the Gospel in the hearts and the lives of those that we have the privilege to meet, then it is our responsibility to begin to pray that Satan will not steal away the seed that has been planted. That it will not be rejected. It will not be ignored. But that it will be freely received. And that person might come to be saved. Because you see, here's the bottom line. When it comes to this thing of salvation, you don't get a second chance. You don't get a second chance. 
That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 2, the Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. No, right now. If you're not sure about it, I hope you'll get it settled. Hope you get it settled.